So my name is Yi Xin. I'm a faculty at uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania. Um, before I moved to Philadelphia last September, I was actually on the faculty of UCLA for six years. And um, all of the work I'm going to talk about today was done by several talented graduate students in the uh, UCLA Bioinformatics PhD program. Uh, so it's very nice to be able to come back and share their work with you. Um, so my lab um, develops uh, computational methods and genomic technologies to study RNA processing and modification. We're also interested in applying those uh, technologies and methods to important problems in human genetics and also medicine. Um, one of the major um, interests of the lab is this um, process called RNA alternative splicing. Um, so this is a really important regulatory mechanism that can substantially diversify the mammalian transcriptome and the proteome. So here I'm showing you a very simple cartoon example of alternative splicing involving a 3-exon gene in which the middle exon is alternative spiced. And if you look at this picture, by alternatively including and skipping this middle exon, the red exon, from the final mRNA product, we can generate two distinct mRNA isoforms from the, a single gene. They could potentially be translated into two different protein isoforms that could carry different biological functions. So this is a very simple cartoon diagram, but the you know, transcriptomics field in the past two decades have de has demonstrated that this process is extremely prevalent in mammalian cells. In fact, almost all multi-exon human genes produce alternative mRNA and protein isoforms. And there are also many different, you know, individual forms of alternative splicing, ranging from those most simple form of exon skipping, which is basically alternative inclusion skipping of a single exon, but you can have other forms like alternative use of spice size at one end of the axon, mutually exclusive axon usage, intron retention. And also in many multi-axon genes, you actually have complex alternative splicing patterns that involves the combination of those simple patterns. So those process is very important for regulating gene function and activity in normal biological processes, and also apparent in alternative splicing due to genomic mutations or altered activities of regulatory proteins uh, represents the major cause of human diseases from monogenic genetic disorders to complex diseases and cancer. Um, so nowadays, um, with the development of sequencing technologies, RNA sequencing has uh, become the you know, popular tool for study alternative splicing. Um, so if you generate RNA-seq data on a given biological sample at a sufficient depth, you not only can uncover the gene expression level, but you can also uncover the splicing levels and activities of individual splice sites or exons across the transcriptome. Um, so here I'm just showing you an example of a data set we generated a few years ago on a pair of human prostate cancer cell lines with very different morphology and functional properties. So, so I'm showing you the UC Santa Cruz uh, Genome Browser Custom Track. And if you look at the gene on top, you can see that most exons are highly expressed in both cell lines with you know, biological replicate, triplicates for the experiment. But you can see one exon, which is exon 13 here, which is very high in one cell line and completely absent from a different cell line. So in the bottom, we have a more complex situation in this gene called CD44, where you have a group of 10 exons in the middle, which are highly expressed in one cell line, but absent from a different cell line. So those types of cell type specific changes in splicing activities often underlie important gene regulatory programs that drive cell differentiation, reprogramming, cell fate specification, and also various diseases. Um, so this was really a small data set produced a number of years ago. But nowadays, if you look at all those rna data datasets in the community, we really have massive amount of rna data coming from large consortia projects and also small labs. And in fact, if you look into, for example, the um, so NCBI, GEO, and R SRA archive, currently there are over you know, rna data datasets on over 100,000 human samples. And if you look at some of those very large consortia projects, such as ENCODE, epigenome roadmap, TCG, and GTEx, those projects are generating massive amount of rna profiles across different human cell states, perturbation conditions, different tissues, and also in diseases. And also a lot of those data sets are also coupled to other types of information at the genomic and also phenotypic and the clinical levels. 
So those last large data sets create a lot of interesting opportunities for us to understand the regulation and also the functional consequences of alternative isoform variation in the transcriptome. So, um, so, so for the past few years, one of the major interests of our computational lab has been the development of robust and also sensitive computational tools for studying alternative spicing and isoform variation using those RNA-seq big data. Two of the representative tools we developed over the last few years, one is this tool called RMATS, which allows us to quantify RNA spicing levels at individual axons and spice sites across many samples, and also detect which axon or spice site has undergone differential alternative spicing, essentially differential you know, isoform proportions across different biological states. And we recently actually published, uh, you know, released a new version of RMS called RMS Turbo, which is over a thousand times faster than the initial version. This really allows us to perform ultra-fast spicing quantitation across a massive RNA seq data set. And another tool which we recently published, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, you know, in this talk, is another tool called Deep Learning, called Darts, uh, which actually uses deep learning predictions and couple those deep learning models with the empirical RNA seq data to improve the precision of um, spicing analysis. So before I talk about this Darts framework. I first I will just you know, use two slides to introduce what we are doing with spicing quantitation and what are the major problems in this field. Um, so if you think about how you use RNA-seq to quantify alternate spicing, this is actually a pretty simple thing to do. So if you have RNA-seq data on a given biological sample, we basically map those reads to the genome and we can obtain the read count and the density along the genomic region. So usually you have very high density in axons, very little density in introns, which is what you typically see by sequencing the mature RNA products of a cell. At the same time, we also map those reads to uh, what we refer to as the spice junction sequences. So those spice junction sequences are basically sequences connecting adjacent axons with the middle axon spliced out. So those sequences are very important for spicing analysis because they are present in the transcriptome but they are not present in the genome. So if you see reads mapping to those spice junctions, we are fairly certain that a spicing event has occurred between two axons. Um, so once you obtain those read counts and density, we can start to infer you know, levels of spicing. So within a single sample, we can infer isoform proportion. And beyond the single sample, we often are interested in looking for axons that have shifted usage between different samples or conditions, which we refer to as differential spicing events. So this sounds like a very simple calculation. But the one issue that we have to emphasize is that in this analysis, we're trying to measure you know, the isoform proportion using count data. In fact, in this field, one commonly used the metric that you're going to see over and over again in reading the literature is this thing called the psi, which stands for percent spliced in. So this basically represents this metric of what percentage of transcripts from this uh, you know, gene include a particular axon or spine site. So this is a number that ranges from 0% to 100%. So if you have 0%, that, has, that means complete axon skipping. If it's 100%, that means a complete axon inclusion. And the true alternative axon should have a number you know, between 0 to 100%. So if you look at this cartoon example here, you, you can see that we have a axon here and you have the same number of reads matching to the uh, you know, exon inclusion and skipping junctions. So we can easily calculate an exon inclusion level of 50% in this case. But one thing that we have to emphasize is that we're trying to use those counts to derive the ratio. So we can imagine three different scenarios where you know, one is you're taking one divided by two, another is 10 divided by 20, another is 100 divided by 200. So it's almost like you're flipping the coin and you're trying to assess the proportion, right? So, so the confidence you have in that ratio estimate is very much dependent on how many you know, counts you have. So if you have a lot of counts, then you're going to have very reliable estimate. But if your count is very little, that means you're not going to have reliable estimate. And this is actually a primary reason when we talk to our 
colleagues about how to design the RNA-6 study to look at the splicing, we always advise them to go as deep as possible with their sequencing experiment. In fact, there was a review article a year ago by Aru Chinaya at um, University of Michigan on Nature Reviews Genetics, where they you know, you know, stated that you need much higher read depths, such as 100 million paradigm reads, to uh, perform you know, alternative splicing analysis from the RNA seq data. So, so the reality is that the vast majority of RNA seq you know, data sets or the experiments that people are generating are nowhere near this sequencing depth. And even if you can afford to, to go very deep with the RNA seq experiment, we still have this other problem that the transcriptome is not uniform. There are many medically important genes like CFTR, which is actually moderately or lowly expressed in the cell type of interest. Um, so, so they almost like represent this kind of dark matters of the transcriptome, which are very hard to interrogate using traditional sequencing methods. And also, if you just look further a few years, if you think about the new technologies on the horizon, such as single cell RNA sequencing or long read RNA sequencing, the problem of not having enough coverage is only going to get worse in the next few years instead of getting better. So we really want to come up with a method which can address these major limitations in using RNA seq to study spicing. Um, so. Um, so one thing I should mention is that in the last you know, decade, you know, or especially in the last few years, there have been exciting developments in the machine learning field of using machine learning and deep learning methods to study RNA regulation, including to predict alternative splicing. So I'm listing two uh, Lampard papers from Brandon Fraser's group at University of Toronto, in which they developed this method called the splicing code. Um, basically, they extract sequence features around alternative axons and use those sequence features to construct machine learning models to predict splicing. So the general workflow of those work is that you start with the input data, you extract the genomic sequence features, you also use either splicing array or RNA seq data to measure splicing patterns. So then you can actually build, you know, generate all sorts of features at the RNA level, you know, for example, the strength of the splicing signals, RNA secondary structure, um, you know, the presence of motifs for binding by different RNA binding proteins. So all those features can be fed into a machine learning model to predict the patterns of splicing in a given sample, and this could be then validated using experimental strategies. So this work has been very successful. But one of the limitations of the previous work is that they basically just use the cis features. So if you only use the cis feature, which represents the static features in the genome, it becomes difficult to capture dynamic change of splicing in response to perturbation across different cellular conditions. So this was the motivation for us to come up with this model called the DARTS, which stands for Deep Learning Augmented RNA-seq Analysis of Transcript Spicing. So in the next few slides, I'm going to go through different components of the DARTS model. Um, but here I'm just going to just, but intuitively what DARTS is doing is that a lot, a lot of investigators, when they study spicing, they generate rna seq data on their particular samples. So what DARTS is doing is that it leverages two types of information. One is that it looks at the data set you generated on your own sample of interest, and it uses rna seq data to infer which axons or spicing event undergo differential usage. At the same time, it also uses a, deep, you know, a prediction generated from deep learning model to predict given the sequence feature, as well as the concentrations of RNA binding proteins in different conditions, which axon should undergo change between those different conditions. So those deep learning predictions is then used in DARTS as a prior probability in the Bayesian model. So we can actually inc you know, incorporate both empirical evidence as the likelihood, as well as the deep learning prediction as a prior to improve the precision of a spicing analysis. Um, so this was the intuitive you know, concept behind DARTS. So one of the uh, you know, important components of the DARTS is a deep neural network to predict differential splicing. So the problem here is that we have two biological conditions, and we have you know, measured the you know, expression levels of our, you know, different you know, genes in those different conditions. 
Um, and then we want to predict which axon should change between those two conditions. Um, so, so the DARS DNN uses two types of information. One, you know, types of information are basic, is basically six regulatory features around our 20 axons that represents the spy size strength, the secondary structure, and other motif and the conservation information. And another types of feature which, which we refer to as RBP features, basically, you know, are features that represent the expression level, the mRNA abundance of RNA binding proteins between two biological conditions. And those RNA binding proteins are master regulators of RNA processing, including alternative splicing. And actually, in many biological processes, differential expression of RNA binding proteins could change splicing patterns. So basically, the DARS model considers both the static cis genome information and also those transient uh, dynamic information about the abundance of RNA binding proteins. And we can fill that into a deep neural network architecture to predict which axons are ch should change or should not change between those two conditions. So this is the DNN architecture, but we need some training data to train this deep neural network. And we took advantage of the fact that the encoding investigators in the past few years have generated an enormous amount of data to study RNA binding proteins. Um, so for example, Brenton uh, Gravely and Jing Yao's group have done systematic knockdown of over 250 RNA binding proteins in two human cell lines, K562 and HEPG2, um, followed by RNA sequencing of those samples. So then if you compare you know, the samples where a particular RNA binding protein is knocked down versus the untreated control, we can, you know, in each comparison, we can discover hundreds of differentially used axons. So across the entire ENCO data set, they have two types, you know, so, so for about 200, um, uh, RNA binding proteins, the RNA binding protein, you know, are knocked, is knocked down in both cell lines. So we basically use those RBP data as the training data set for training the DARS DNN. And there is another set of about 58 RBPs, which was only knocked down in one of the two cell lines, but not both. So in, in our work, we basically take aside those RBPs and hide them from the training process. So we use that for in, in the later stage for evaluating the performance of the DARS model. So now we have this data, we also need to generate some training labels. So we came up with a Bayesian you know, framework, uh, you know, method which basically calculates the probability of a particular axon undergoing differential splicing given the observed counts data. So now this model is just based on counts data. It does not use any types of um, you know, deep learning predictions. So if you take this particular method, what it will tell us is that there is basically a set of axons where we have very high confidence that this axon undergoes differential splicing. So basically, very high posterior probability for change. But then there is also another set of axons where we can consider them as high confidence unchanged. What I mean by that is that, you know, from the statistical test, you don't see any change. And also, this is not because you have lack of power for that event. You really have a lot of counts, and those axons are truly not changing. And then there is also a middle set of axons, which we refer to as inconclusive. So what we do is that we basically take the high confidence unchanged and the high confidence differential and use those two different sets as the training data set for DARS. So now we have our training data set, we have a DNN architecture, we can start to train this DARS uh, deep neural network. And we can see that after, you know, kind of multi, you know, basically, as the training progresses, the performance of the DARS model increases uh, progressively. And in the end, we can reach a um, area on the curve of about 85%, 0.85 uh, in the, uh, the cross-validation. And then the other test we did was that we basically took the trained DARS DNN and also a, a variety of other more baseline methods and we apply that to those leave out data set to see if we can get good performance. And if you look at this curve, which is a panel D on the right, you can see that the DARS DNN can also predict the leave out data set quite well. And those are the RBP knockdown experiments that were never used as part of the training. So now we have established that we have a deep neural network that can predict differential splicing. So we want to put them back together with the empirical data to basically generate this innovation framework. So this is the basic intuitive framework of the, you know, the, the final DARS model. So 
on one hand, you know, we have the, you know, so if you are comparing RNA-seq data between two conditions, uh, we can use the observed RNA-seq count and, you know, and using this Bayesian model that I just mentioned to basically compute the probability of differential splicing for every axon. But at the same time, we can use DARS to extract cis sequence features as well as the expression levels of RNA binding proteins, which is independent of whatever you measure on your axon of interest, and then use deep learning to generate a prior for you know, whether this axon should change or not. And we can use this Bayesian framework to incorporate that. And so, so the basic, you know, intuitively, if you think about what DARS is doing, it's basically saying that if you have a lot of data, you know, very high counts on a particular spicing event, we trust your data. But if you don't have a lot of counts, if your data is fuzzy because this is a lowly expressed gene, you don't have a lot of information, then we make use a deep learning prediction as the prior to make some educated guesses. So if you think about this framework, then you know, the, the next question is, does the use of the prior probability really improves uh, differential spicing analysis? So if you think about this, we can actually come up with you know, two different ways of running DARS. One is to just use the you know, empirical data. So we call this as a DARS flat. And then another way of doing it is to really incorporate this um, prior probability, and we call this as DARS info. So the question is, does DARS info outperforms DARS flat in the differential spicing analysis? So, so, so we actually did a variety of tests to address this question, but you know, just for the interest of time, I'm just going to show you one analysis. So we actually took advantage of the fact that when ENCODE investigators were generating the rna data for this big RBP project, they generated a lot of controls. So they actually did 28 controls for one cell line, which is K562, and another 24 controls on HEPG2. So you basically have ultra deep rna data dataset on these two human cell lines. So we can basically, for each cell line, we pull those replicates together, and we use this ultra deep data set to generate a very high confidence set of cell type specific spicing event. And then we can basically go back to those individual replicates. Remember, we have 24 replicates for one cell line, 28 replicates for another cell line. So we can basically use both DARS info and DARS flat to do 28 times 24 pairwise comparisons. And we can use those ultra deep data set to evaluate the performance of this analysis at lower coverage. So what you can see is that if you measure the performance in the form of AUPR, you can see that DARS info almost always outperforms DARS you know, flat, meaning that the use of those of prior probability improves the detection of cell type specific spicing. And then if you look at where you actually get the gain in performance, remember we have almost like 900 different comparisons. So if you are doing comparison between replicates with very high sequencing depths, you can see that the gain is modest. But if you are going with comparisons of low coverage data set, we start to see a major improvement in the performance. So in, the, in another word, the performance gain is anti-correlated with sequencing depths. In lower sequencing data set, the DARS DNA model actually improves the differential spicing analysis. So the final thing I'm going to show you with this work is just the other question, like what kind of data should we use for a training data set? So in this case, you know, so far everything I've been talking about so far is basically using the INCO data, which is just the you know, lockdown experiments on two different human cell lines. But you know, can this model be applied to more diverse situations or looking at the different tissues or maybe looking at, you know, you know, processes such as cell differentiation or cancer metastasis. Um, so, so to address this question, we decided to train DARS model using additional data sets. So we basically took both INCO data as well as the roadmap epigenetics the genomics data, which captures RNA-seq information for over 100 different human cell lines and different conditions. And we basically generated both the training samples and also leave out samples for both ENCODE and roadmap. And then through this process, we can train three DARS models. One is the DARS model trained on ENCODE. Another is the DARS model trained on roadmap. And the third one is the DARS model trained on both ENCODE and roadmap. And to make a long story short, what we see is that the DARS model trained on ENCODE data predicts ENCODE leave out data set very well. 
but you know, you know, but the performance on the raw map leave out data is moderate. And also similarly, if you train a dust model on the raw map data, you know, it predicts the raw map leave out data very well, but not very well on the encode data. But the DARS model trained on both encode and raw map data actually have the best performance, which is what we would expect even before we did this analysis. So what we are saying here is that the use of diverse training data set you know, would improve the ability of DARS to generalize to different conditions. And in fact, you know, we, you know, in this work, we demonstrated that if we take the DARS model trained on the whole data set, we can go to other cellular systems, such as the, you know, in, in our work, a model of cancer cell metastasis, and we can use DARS to identify novel differential splicing events that are missed by conventional method because they are in genes that are lowly expressed. Um, so just to summarize this part of work, we, you know, I just talked about this model called DARS uh, for aggregating you know, you know, large scale data to generate this deep learning model for differential splicing. Um, so, so, so essentially what DAS is doing is that it basically relies on the fact that there is a large amount of public data, RNA seq data set across different human cells and conditions, which contains a lot of information about splicing regulation. So DARS basically transforms those information in the large scale data into a knowledge base of splicing regulation in the form of deep neural network. And then this deep neural network can be used to generate a prior probability and then be used in any individual studies in individual labs to improve the precision of splicing analysis. Um, so this work was done by two you know, graduate students in my lab, Zijun Zhang and Zhi uh, Chenpan. And Zijun actually just defended his PhD in bioinformatics here two weeks ago. So he's starting a new postdoc at Princeton um, uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, so, um, so for the, you know, and we also think that this, you know, the, the concept behind this is a kind of interesting concept of, uh, you know, basically using Bayesian model to incorporate deep learning predictions. And this could potentially be applied to other problems in regulatory genomics where, for example, in high C and other problems where you're always limited by sequencing depths. Um, so for, you know, for the, for the next part of my talk, I'm going to just switch the gear a little bit. I'm going to show you how we can use those kind of large scale rna seq data to really generate insight about human disease. And I'm going to focus specifically on cancer. Um, so we actually know from many years of study that cancer cells often have, you know, difference in splicing patterns compared to normal cells. And in fact, if you look at this classical diagram for eight different hallmarks of cancer, for every cancer hallmark, there, there, is basic, there are basically well-studied alternative splicing events that actually contribute to those cancer hallmarks. So for example, you know, the alternative splicing in this CD44 gene, which I showed you like at the beginning of my talk, is really important for activating you know, uh, invasion and metastasis. Um, so, um, so, so, so the, for the data I'm going to show you today, I'm going to tell you an unpublished uh, work uh, in which we um, you know, use a signaling pathway-driven approach to comprehensively study alternative splicing in the progression of prostate cancer. So this was done by another graduate student, you know, Yang Pan in the lab, uh, in collaboration with John Phillips, Owen Whitty, and Doug Beck at UCLA. Um, so before I get into the details, I just want to you know, say a few words about prostate cancer. Um, so, uh, so prostate cancer actually undergoes a natural progression you know, from the normal prostate epithelium into those precancerous lesions. And then you're going to have those localized adenocarcinoma, which will start to have clinical symptoms. And then those cancers will eventually metastasize into those very malignant you know, phenotype representing castration resistant or neuroendocrine prostate cancer. So once, you know, so, so, so on the right part, those are the cancers that actually kills the patient. Um, so, um, and in fact, about 20% of the tumors treated with this classical and, you know, anti-androgen therapy will eventually develop resistance uh, associated with those uh, small cell phenotypes, and those patients will, will have very poor prognosis. So in the past, you know, various groups have measured, uh, you know, transcriptome patterns and, auto, and also alternative splicing patterns within each individual disease state. 
But here we are interested in collapsing multiple large scale data sets to really track the progression of prostate cancer and also to look at what are the changes in splicing events and what are the upstream regulatory mechanisms that, that drive those changes. And to look into this question, we um, came up with a, a scalable big data framework to, proce uh, to process you know, alternative splicing landscape you know, across you know, thousands of samples. And we use this uh, very efficient splicing graph implementation in the RMS Turbo tool, so we can really you know, process a large number of samples efficiently. Um, so, we, so, so in this work, we collected data from different disease stages, you know, the normal prostate tissue from GTAX, the primary tumor from TCGA, and also various data sets in DBE gap that represents the late stage of the disease. So in total, we looked at about 900 samples, and we used uh, RMS Turbo to uniformly process, you know, spicing information across those 900 samples. So one of the interesting things that we found out, you know, after we finished this analysis was that, um, you know, if you take the spicing data across those 900 samples, and if you just do a naive PCA analysis, you just take the exon inclusion ratio, which is the percent measurement I was talking about, we can actually generate three very nice clusters that represent different disease stage. So if you look at this, you can see that the primary tumors, um, you know, are here. The normal prostate tissues are here, and then the all the metastatic tissues are here. So you see very nice class, you know, clustering of the disease stage according to information of spicing. But if you actually use the gene expression level or count based the transcript expression levels, you can see that the cluster is not nearly as, as clear. And this is actually consistent with uh, observations made by us and other groups in other settings where it seems that by taking a ratio between two transcript products within the single gene, the splicing measurement has this nice property of having internal control. So they may be more resistant to, you know, common issues of batch effects and artifacts, which will really be a problem when you in aggregate multiple large data sets. So now we, you know, we have those splicing measurements for tens of thousands of exons across indiv each individual. Um, so we came up with, so John Phillips and Yang Peng came up with this pathway guided approach, which we now refer to as a Pegasus, to capture changes of exon usage across disease stage and associate those changes to activities in signaling pathways. So, so the way this works is that you have, like say, 900 people, for each person, we can measure the spicing levels of every exon, so we can measure, so you have a data matrix, which is that, you, you know, you have the, for each of these spicing events, you have the spicing measurement across those 900 people. We also use a gene set analysis method to basically score the activities of every major signaling pathways uh, across those 900 people. So again, so for each pathway, you have a pathway score across those 900 people. So now we can take those two values and perform correlation analysis, and we can actually, um, you know, assess, um, you know, the significance of the correlation using a permutation procedure. Um, so this is just on the right, I'm just showing you uh, pictures of three classical cancer pathways in prostate cancer, showing that the pathway score we generated actually resembles disease biology. So for example, if you look at the top pathway, which is this androgen receptor signaling pathway, you can see that the pathway score goes up gradually in early stages of the disease. But once you go, once the disease goes into, you know, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, which is not dependent on androgen signaling anymore, you can see that the pathway score dropped substantially. And in the middle, you have, you know, in the bottom, you can see this is the mixed signaling pathway, where you can see gradual increase of mixed signaling activity as the disease progresses. So now with this pathway score and with this exon spicing level, we can perform correlation analysis. So we can actually identify a lot of interesting alternative spicing events that are strongly associated with those signaling pathways. So for example, in this particular case, we can, you know, I'm showing you two alternative exons. One in this, uh, you know, spicing factor, which also happens to be an oncology gene uh, in a variety of cancers. And you can see that there is an alternative exon in this SRSF3 gene whose spicing level is strongly anti-correlated with MIC activity. And you can also see that by looking at this genome alignment plot called sashimi plots, where 
you can see that axon inclusion level is about 20% in the primary tumor, but goes to just 5% in the castration-resistant prostate cancer. On the right side, you ha we have a similar situation uh, where you can see that this is the HROS gene, which is another oncon gene. There is an axon in this gene, which is anti-correlated with the MIC activity. So we can actually apply this analysis to all pathways, to all axons. So we can actually generate this kind of pathway-guided map that tells us that which axons are correlated with which signaling pathway. And we perform this analysis across 10,000 axon skipping events for about 50 important oncogenic signaling pathways in prostate cancer. So you can see that for each part, so each row is a pathway. Some axons are positively correlated, some axons are negatively correlated. And so, so if you think this heat map is hard to look at, we can actually represent this kind of result in another plot called the Hive plot, which is a very nice way to visualize molecular interaction networks. So on this Hive plot, you know, this axis is basically the, oops, the axon axis. And then, you, you know, so whenever an axon is correlated with a signaling pathway, you have a line between those things. And then whenever, you know, we can also perform goal analysis for axons associated with this pathway. So we can now see that some of the pathways are really enriched in, um, in specific goal terms. So one of the, you know, really interesting observation, if you look at this hive plot, is that a number of oncogenic signaling pathways, such as MIC, E2F, and mTOR, they are correlated axons are often found, uh, you know, in genes encoding you know, regulatory or core components of spicing. So what, another way of saying this is that a lot of genes that are important for spicing regulation, their spicing patterns are disrupted during the progression of prostate cancer due to altered activities of those signaling pathways. Um, but, you know, so, so for example, among the, those different pathways, one pathway that we were really interested in studying is this MIC pathway. So MIC is also, also referred to as the oncon gene from the hell because it's dysregulated in a variety of, you know, human cancers. It drives a very malignant phenotype. Um, so, um, but, but to the question, we, you know, if we step back, you have to realize that so far, everything we have done so far is, you know, is basically a correlation analysis. We have you know, used the patient data to demonstrate that certain axons are correlated with certain signaling pathways. That doesn't mean that those pathways affect axon usage, right? So correlation doesn't mean causation. So to take a step further, you know, what we really need to do is to actually perform a genetic perturbation experiment. So I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going through this very quickly. So, you said, so, so basically what we did, what, what we did is that Owen Whitty's lab generated a model for, you know, transform the human prostate cancer cell lines in which you can basically use doxycycline to dynamically control the abundance of MIC. So you can basically have cell lines with very high level of MIC and also an isogenic cell line from the same, generated from the same patient where you withdraw dox and then the MIC expression level goes down. So this uh, you know, system basically gives us a very nicely controlled genetic perturbation system in which we can directly assess the causal impact, impact of MIC on RNA spicing. Um, so we show that this system works and we generated RNA seq data on cell lines from three different human donors with both high and low level of MIC. So if you look at those MIC regulated axons in those uh, controlled cell line experiments, what we see is that the, the MIC, depend, MIC regulated axons identified from the cell lines largely overlap with the MIC correlated axons in the human prostate cancer tissue samples, representing, so, so this tells us that those are truly MIC driven axons across the prostate cancer. And so again, so if you look at these two examples I showed you a moment ago, you can see that, um, you know, the SRF3 axon, you know, is low when you have high level of MIC, but when the MIC level goes up, then this axon goes, you know, you know, goes down. So uh, we see the same picture with HRAS. And we can also do this for other cancers. So we did the analysis, not just for prostate cancer, but we can look at the breast cancer and lung cancer, which also has those MIC activity. Again, we can see that the MIC correlated axons also conserved between prostate and breast cancers. Um, so, so right now, one of our major interests in this case, you know, in this study going forward is that we actually found that a, a number of those MIC-driven axons 
could be translated into peptides that could potentially be recognized by the human T cells. So we're actually conducting studies to identify novel cancer-specific antigens coming from those spicing events, which could be used as novel targets for, uh, you know, for cancer immunotherapy. So we're actually developing those kind of approaches to you know, systematically discover novel RNA-derived cancer antigens across a variety of human cancers. Um, I think I'm just going to stop here, and I'd like to thank people in the lab who contributed to this project. So the DARTS was a joint work by two graduate students, uh, Zijun Zhang and also Zhi Chenpan here. Um, so the, the second part of my story on prostate cancer was primarily done by another graduate student, Yang Pen, in collaboration with Owen Wittes group at UCLA. And also like to thank um, you know, funding agencies uh, for, for supporting our work, and thank you.